A Russian court has sentenced the jailed opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. Kremlin's most vocal critic had been sent to prison. A court in Russia has sentenced jailed Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny. Russia's most prominent Putin critic was being sent to jail. Alexei Navalny, who has uh, just been convicted to 19 uh, years uh, in prison. Today, Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny received his third prison sentence. At this point, the length of his prison term doesn't really mean anything. The fact is, Navalny has been given a life sentence. The only question is whose life it's going to be. Here's of Vladimir Putin's. Now let's try to understand why Navalny was put in prison. The charges were extremism, whatever that means, and trying to violently overthrow the government. <laughs> Except he didn't actually do any of that. Here is what he did do. Привет, это Навальный. Я приму участие в борьбе за пост президента России. Вы чиновники, сидящие на моей шее. Do we have authorization in Moscow? The answer is no. Потому что сопротивление. Это когда ты делаешь что-то. Дворец Путина под Геленджиком. Подписывайтесь на наш канал. Здесь говорят правду. And this is the biggest threat Putin's regime has faced so far. A peaceful, democratic political force, a real alternative. Navalny has essentially built Russia's only opposition party. It wasn't allowed to officially register and you won't find it on any ballot. But it has won the support of millions. This is the real reason Navalny is in prison today. So the formal charges are pure fiction. You'd think that to press charges like an attempt to violently overthrow the government, you would need, you know, at least some evidence. <laughs> I mean, we know that Putin's judicial system isn't exactly a Swiss watch, but still, there must be something they have got on Navalny, right? No, no. Maybe some documents showing he was planning a coup? or got secret military training, or some evidence that he was plotting to kidnap Putin, seize his palace and convert it into a world-class museum of bad taste. And if they didn't have such documents, you would think that they would at least give it a good effort and forge some. Well, they didn't bother. This is it, the 196 volume case against Navalny. Their grounds for putting him and others behind bars for decades. Actually, we are not supposed to have this, the case is completely classified. By showing you this, I am committing a criminal offence. But on the other hand, who cares? 50,000 pages, hundreds of interviewed witnesses, thousands of hours investigators spent watching Navalny's YouTube channel. Searches, analysis, confiscations. <laughs> And nothing. Zero. Not a shred of evidence, not a single coherent argument. A total void. They didn't even try to pretend to compile a real case. Most of the documents have nothing to do with Navalny. It's just a bunch of screenshots from the internet. Like this one from my colleague's Instagram. Ivan posted a picture of a nice flow on the Pichora River. Nice shot, Ivan. And uh, we're supposed to believe it's evidence of Navalny's extremism. And um, here is another picture from Instagram. It's another colleague of mine, uh, Leonid Volkov. It's the Madrid International Airport. Leonid says he really likes it. Could it be a code for something? What do you mean a code? Like a super secret spy code? Navalny's extremism is also proven by snowmen holding signs, scanned dollar bills, a lanyard for a badge and a CD with a ruler. One of this actually reads Vova, that's short for Vladimir. Uh, Vova, it's over. Good one. This picture from the case files shows my other colleague, Daniel Halodny, who was also sentenced today. Navalny's extremism is demonstrated by the issue of Time magazine, this one, that Daniel was forced to pose with. His copy of the magazine, by the way, was confiscated as evidence. It's all pretty good stuff, but now, my favorite. These 45 pages are a report 
on the results of a surveillance operational search measure. And yes, it sounds just as ridiculous in Russian. The operation started at 9.30 a.m. on June 6, 2022 and ended the same day at 6.45 p.m. All this time, for nine hours, a lieutenant colonel, a real-life Sherlock Holmes, was examining the website of the Washington publication The Hill. He opens the homepage and just describes everything he sees. From left to right, against the blue background, there are sections like news, policy, opinion, events, jobs. Our Eagle Eye investigator goes on to do the same thing for every page of the website. He makes sure to note that he's pressing the print screen key to take screenshots. And he's not lying. There are pages and pages of screenshots from the hill in the wellness case. Even the who we are section has been documented for posterity with each name carefully written in Cyrillic. Finally, we see what they were actually after, an article about Navalny. Screenshots, more screenshots and screenshots, and that's it. The end. <laughs> All the results of this high-tech operation are recorded on a DVD-R marked D-E-N-Y, D-M-101 placed in a white envelope and sealed with a stamp of the main directorate for countering extremism. Good work, boys. So that's the script of this circus, and here is where the clowns performed. You may have seen these images from Navalny's trial. It sort of doesn't look like a courtroom, does it? And there is a good reason. It isn't one. It's an assembly hall called The Club, inside the prison where Navalny is being held. They turned it into a makeshift courtroom just for him. Again, instead of taking place at a court in Moscow, as you would expect, this trial was held inside a prison, hours from the capital. Everyone involved, except Navalny himself, traveled there daily for hearings. Judges from Moscow, prosecutors, witnesses, lawyers, they all came here but no one else was allowed in. Even Navalny's elderly parents, who haven't seen him in over a year, were turned away at the door without a chance to see their son. All this is to ensure that this political persecution stays under the radar. No cameras, no official records, and no way you're going to catch a glimpse of the judge or prosecutors. Crimes like this demand silence. In Putin's dream scenario, Navalny simply doesn't exist. No one should talk about him, no one should remember him. That's what Putin wants. We guarantee it will be a priority national project. First, he tried to make this happen quite directly by poisoning Navalny with Novichok. When that failed to kill him, Putin decided to bury him in prison. But why? Why embarrass yourself in front of the whole world with kangaroo courts? Why these jail sentences straight out of Stalin's playbook? Why keep Navalny in prison and not just in any prison, but in one of the harshest in Russia, in solitary confinement? He's afraid of, not about me, but he's afraid of people who are represented. Let me paint a picture of solitary for you. It's a concrete box measuring two and a half by three meters. At five in the morning sharp, the guards chain the bed up to the wall. You can't sit. You can't lie down. You are stuck on a backless stool all day gazing at the wall. The only entertainment is a radio speaker that Navalny can't turn off. The prison DJ spins patriotic music exclusively for him. And every evening, every evening, he is forced to listen to the same speech by Putin. This one. То есть они намерены перевести локальный конфликт фазу глобального противостояния. В данном случае речь идет уже о существовании. Они также не могут не отдавать себе отчет в том, что победить Россию на фоне чего на передовой сражаются войны из всех регионов нашей многонациональной Родины. Но все они за победу, за боевых товарищей, за Родину. To understand reasons for all this, we have to take a big step back and remember how we got here. First time. <laughs> If you have never heard of Navalny, well, here he is in 2013, during his campaign to become mayor of Moscow, with thousands of Moscovites rallying behind him. This is him recording hundreds of investigative videos, shedding light on corrupt political elites and Putin's inner circle. 
Here he is again leading the massive protest that followed one of those investigations. That's 2017. This is our office in Moscow, where a hundred young people worked hard to pursue their dream of free and democratic Russia, despite the risks involved. And this is Navalny during his 2018 presidential run. He opened regional headquarters all over Russia in 80 cities. 200 people worked there, thousands volunteered. This headquarters became magnets for Russians who cared about politics, for activists and young politicians whom Navalny helped run in local elections. And here is Navalny screaming on a plane, flying from Siberia to Moscow. He's about to slip into a coma, and we will spend days fighting to get him out of this rundown hospital in Omsk, crawling with spies and police. We'd later find out Navalny was poisoned with Novichok. We investigated it and traced it back to the FSB, acting on Putin's orders. And then, in the most epic prank call in world history, Navalny chatted with one of his poisoners. He confessed to everything. If he was going to Navalny is one of the most improbable things that has ever happened to Russia. When Putin came to power in 1999, politics was supposed to end, together with freedom of speech and fair elections. The whole point of this was to prevent someone like Navalny from appearing. I think about it, what uh, I can to do with uh, all our citizens. I grew up in Russia during this time, and I assure you, it was a political wasteland. Politics didn't exist. Even if you were interested, you had nowhere to go. Media outlets reporting on politics were shut down. Independent TV was crushed by 2001. Opposition parties didn't exist. Instead, some old clowns were hired to play the part of Putin critics. And guess what? Putin looked just great compared to them. And most importantly, the Kremlin indoctrinated us. Politics is repulsive, it is dirty, it is not for us little people. Just carry on with your life and Putin will take care of politics. And then, against all odds, in a country where freedom is being suffocated and apathy is rewarded, Navalny appears. A young, charismatic lawyer who blogs about corruption and politics. He criticizes Putin exactly as you would, using the very words you would use. He worries about the same problems and he speaks out. He runs in elections and these elections become the most significant political event of the decade. He isn't mentioned on TV or featured in newspapers, but his popularity only grows. They pressure him, detain him, put him under house arrest, imprison his brother, but he doesn't give up. If I will stop, it means all these sacrifices this are useless. And they are not, and I do believe in what I'm doing, and I do believe that my alternative is better for Russia. Navalny has returned politics to Russia, and he has also done something very important. He has shown us that we are not alone. Navalny's work strikes a real blow to Putin's regime. It ruins his plans. His plans to rule forever, to bathe in worship and adoration, his plans to rob the country blind and build himself palaces and yurts. His plans to invade the neighbors, wipe them off the map, and restore the empire. Navalny is everything Putin isn't, and could never hope to become a real politician. To this day, Navalny remains the only opposition figure in Russia with substantial power behind him, the power of the millions of people who support him. And even from the darkest hell on earth, from the prison where he is being slowly tortured to death, Navalny's voice is still heard. Yeah, 
И вы своим шизом мне рот не заткнете. Это преступление против моей страны. Я так ровно к нему и отношусь. И я молчать не буду. И я надеюсь, что все остальные, кто слышит меня, на этот счет молчать не будут. Потому что то, что происходит сейчас, гораздо пострашнее, чем любые 12 или 122 суток ШИЗО. Это историческое преступление. Это вовлечение в сотен тысяч людей в преступление, которое делает Путин.